Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing. Today we are once again going to continue to read Moby Dick. Oh, I pressed the wrong button there. So we'll try that again. So, read a book, Moby Dick, and we will be on chapter 13. <clears throat> chapter 13. Wheelbarrow. Next morning, Monday, after disposing of the embalmed head to a barber, for a block, I settled my own and comrade's bill, using, however, my comrade's money. The grinning landlord, as well as the boarders, seemed amazingly tickled at the sudden friendship which had sprung up between me and Queequeg, especially as Peter Coffin's cock and bull stories about him had previously so much alarmed me concerning the very person whom I now companied with. We borrowed a wheelbarrow, and embarking our things, including my own poor carpet bag, and Queequeg's canvas sack and hammock, away we went down to the moss, the little Nantucket packet schooner, moored at the wharf. As we were going along, the people stared, not at Queequeg so much, for they were used to seeing cannibals like him in their streets, but at seeing him and me upon such confidential terms. But we heeded them not, going along the wheeling barrow, going along wheeling the barrow by turns, and Queequeg now and then stopping to adjust the sheath, uh, sheath on his harpoon barbs, I asked him why he carried such a troublesome thing with him ashore, and whether all whaling ships did not find their own harpoons. To this, in substance, he replied, that though what I hinted at was true enough, yet he had a particular affection for his own harpoon, because it was assured stuff, well tried in many a mortal combat, and deeply intimate with the hearts of whales. In short, like many inland reapers and mowers who go into the farmer's meadows armed with their own scythes, though in no wise obliged to furnish them, even so, Queequeg, for his own private reasons, preferred his own harpoon. Shifting the barrow from my hand to his, he told me a funny story about the first wheelbarrow he had ever seen. It was in Sag Harbour. The owners of his ship, it seems, had lent him one, in which to carry his heavy chest to his boarding house. Not to seem ignorant about the thing, though in truth he was entirely so concerning the precise way in which to manage the barrow, Queequeg puts his chest upon it, lashes it fast, and then shoulders the barrow and marches up the wharf. Why, said I, Queequeg, you might have known better than that, one would think. Didn't the people laugh? Upon this he told me another story. The people of his land of Rokokovo, Rokovoko, sorry, it seems at their wedding feasts expressed the fragrant water of young coconuts into a large stained calabash, like a punch bowl, and this punch bowl always forms the great central ornament on the braided mat where the feast is held. Now a certain grand merchant ship once touched at Rokokovo, Rokovoko, sorry, and its commander, from all accounts, a very stately, punct punctilious gentleman, at least for a sea captain, this commander was invited to the wedding feast of Queequeg's sister, a pretty young princess just turned of ten. Well, when all the wedding guests were assembled at the bride's bamboo cottage, this captain marches in, and being assigned the post of honour, placed himself over against the punch bowl, and between the high king, uh, between the high priest and his majesty the king, Queequeg's father. Grace being said, for those people have their grace as well as we, though Queequeg told me that unlike us, who at such times look downwards to our platters, they on the contrary, copying the ducks, glance upwards to the great giver of all feasts. Grace, I say, being said, the high priest opens the banquet by immemorial ceremony on the island that is, dipping his consecrated and consecrating fingers into the bowl before the blessed beverage circulates, seeing himself placed next to the priest and noting the ceremony, and thinking himself, being a captain of a ship, as having plain pre precedence over a mere island king, especially in the king's own house, the captain coolly proceeds to wash his hands in the punch bowl, taking it, I suppose, for a huge finger glass. Now, said Queequeg, what, what you think now? Didn't our people laugh? At last, passage paid and luggage safe, we stood on board the schooner, hoisting sail. It glided down the Akushnet River, 
On one side, New Bedford rows in terraces of streets, their ice-covered trees all glittering in the clear, cold air. Huge hills and mountains of casks on casks were piled upon her wharves, and side by side the world-wandering whale ships lay silent and safely moored at last, while from others came a sound of carpenters and coopers, with blended noises of fires and forges to melt the pitch, all betokening that new cruises were on the start, that one most perilous and long voyage ended only begins a second, and a second ended only begins a third, and so on, forever and for aye. Such is the endlessness, yea, the intolerableness of all earthly effort. Gaining the more open water, the bracing breeze waxed fresh. The little moss tossed the quick foam from her bows, as a young colt his snortings. How I snuffed that tartar air, how I spurned that turnpike earth, that common highway all over, the den all over dented with the marks of slavish heels and hooves, and turned me to admire the magnanimity of the sea which will, which will permit no records. At the same foam fountain, Quigweg seemed to drink and reel with me. His dusky nostrils swelled apart. He showed his filed and pointed teeth. On, on we flew, and our offering and our offing gained. The moss did homage to the blast. Ducked and dived her bows with a slave before the sultan. Sideways leaning, we sideways darted. Every rope yarn tingling like a wire the two tall masts buckling like Indian canes in land tornadoes. So full of this reeling scene we, were we, as we stood by the plunging bowsprit, that for some time we did not notice the jeering glances of the passengers. A lubber-like assembly who marvelled that two fellow beings should be so companionable, as though a white man were anything more dignified than a whitewash. But there were some boobies and bumpkins there, who by their intense gr greenness must have come from the heart and centre of all verdure. Queequeg caught one of these young saplings mimic him, mimicking him behind his back. I thought the bumpkin hour, bumpkin's hour of doom was come. Dropping his harpoon, the brawny savage caught him in his arms, and by an almost miraculous dexterity and strength, sent him high up bodily into the air. Then slightly tapping his stern in mid-somerset, the fellow landed with bursting lungs upon his feet, while Queequeg, turning his back upon him, lighted his tomahawk pipe and passed it to me for a puff. Captain, captain, yelled the bumpkin, running towards that officer. Captain, captain, here's the devil. Hello, you sir, cried the captain, a gaunt rib of the sea, stalking up to Queequeg. What in thunder do you mean by that? Don't you know you might have killed that chap? What him say, said Queequeg, as he mildly turned to me. He say, said I, that you came near Killy, that man there, pointing to the still shivering green hole. Killy, cried Queequeg, twisting his tattooed face into an unearthly expression of disdain. Ah, him bevy smally fishy. Queequeg no Killy. So small, smally fishy. Queequeg kill Killy biggy whale. Look you, roared the captain. I'll killy you, you cannibal, if you try... Any more of your tricks aboard here, so mind your eye. But it so happened just then that it was high time for the captain to mind his own eye. The prodigious strain upon the male mainsail had parted the weather sheet, and the tremendous boom was now flying from side to side, completely sweeping the entire after part of the deck. The poor fellow whom Queequeg had handed so roughly was swept overboard. All hands were in a panic, and to, to attempt snatching at the boom to stay it seemed madness. It flew from right to left and back again, almost in one ticking of a watch, and every instant seemed on the point of snapping into splinters. Nothing was done, and nothing seemed capable of being done. Those on deck rushed towards the bow bows and stood eyeing the boom as if it were the lower jaw of an exasperated whale. In the midst of this consternation, Queequeg dropped deftly to his knees and crawling under the path of the boom, whipped hold of a rope, secured one end to the bulwarks, and then flinging the other like a lasso, caught it round the boom as it swept over his head, and at that next jerk the spar was that way trapped, and all was safe. The schooner was run into the wind, and while the hands were clearing away the stern boat, Queequeg, stripped to the waist, darted from the side with a long living arc of a leap. For three minutes or more he was seen swimming like a dog, throwing his long arms straight out before him, and by turns revealing his brawny shoulders through the freezing foam. 
I looked at the grand and glorious fellow, but saw no one to be saved. The greenhorn had gone down, shooting himself perpendicular, perpendicularly, oh my gosh, I can't say that word, perpendicularly from the water. Queequeg now took an instant glance around him, and seeming to see just how matters were, dived down and disappeared. A few minutes more, and he rose again, one arm still striking out, with the other dragging a lifeless form. The boat soon picked them up. The poor bumpkin was restored. All hands voted Queequeg a noble trump. The captain begged his pardon. From that hour I clove to Queequeg like a barnacle. Yea, till poor Queequeg took his last long dive. Was there ever such unconsciousness? He not, did not seem to think that he at all deserved a medal from the humane and magnanimous societies. He only asked for water, fresh water, something to wash the brine off. That done, he put on dry clothes, lighted his pipe, and leaning against the bulwarks, mildly eyeing those around him, seemed to be, just, seemed to be saying to himself, it's a mutual joint stock world in all meridians. We cannibals must help these Christians. And with that, we come to the end. That was quite nicely timed. So, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night, no matter what time of day it is. I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing, where we will be continuing to read Moby Dick. So, thank you very much, and goodbye.